Welcome. Okay. Namaskar. Welcome to all today's evening. We are going to uh, start uh, next one hour our discussion about the reformation. What we should uh, do or what we need for our Ayurvedic uh, education policy. Because of uh, we are today we are discussing and uh, the ninth edition of World Ayurved Congress. Now I will uh, start uh, next 10 to 15 minutes my presentation. Before that, I will invite uh, one of uh, our uh, senior sci scientist in Ayurveda, uh, Kolkata, that is Central Ayurveda Research Institute. And he is also the state coordinator of West Bengal, uh, Dr. Tusar Kanti Mandal sir, to, uh, for inaugural speech. Tusar well, Kanti Mandal sir. Yes, Dr. Tushar, you can turn on your video. Namaskar. Hello, Achen. Namaskar, hello, hello. Please. Uh, good evening, everybody. And welcome all this uh, seminar on Ayurvedic Buddhas and the status of this Ayurvedic uh, situation in Bengal as well as uh, India. Uh, so we are conducting, you know that uh, Ninth World Education Day, Goa, Panjim, India. So regarding the program, some educational as well as the status of this program and hopefully the future perspectives, whether we will be discuss everything in this uh, program. So major thing is that this ninth World Education Congress. Hello, I, I am, I am, hello, hello, hello. Yes, sir, yes, sir, you are audible. Okay. So this is the ninth session of World Ayurveda Congress, the biggest event in the India regarding Ayurved and all these uh, sectors regarding education, research and the pharma companies all are involved in this program. And also the Ministry of Ayus, Government of India is one of the hosts of this program and other its governments also are presenting these things. So major theme is this program is through the status of this IRA and what are the present situation and what the research, research work is going on. That, uh, and do you know that uh, during that COVID pandemic situations, IRA has this role, the major role as a preventive measure for IRA. You've been hacked, yeah. We driving a long road time in the riding side when we all live life when we are Germany. Germany. Some edits, some edits a lot of Zoom bombing going good? on being hacked right now i guess someone found out it's an ayurvedic meeting so we're not going to admit anyone that doesn't have a name that has. apologies to dr mandal so uh, so i welcome all these delegates who are present who are joining in this program and i first i welcome our madam dr hashwati Vatajaria to host this program as well as dr sumit Sur, the state coordinator from west Bengal and india for hosting this program so uh, Dr. Sumit should really present the uh, details regarding that Ayurvedic world, uh, Ayurvedic status of world at the Congress. And Madam also uh, details discuss regarding these things, what will be going on. Uh, we are expecting so many foreign kind of delegates from more than uh, 40 countries. So uh, this discussion will result that the, what is the things going on and in future, what will be, uh, will be take the part of this as the uh, preventive measures and as well as the important the issues of Ayurveda, what we can discuss in this uh, World Ayurveda Congress. So now, uh, thank you everybody to attend this program and uh, discuss now and will be, again, next uh, program will be continued. So I uh, request Dr. Sumit Sur for the presentation of these things and what will be the present status and the uh, future prospects. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for your valuable opinion. 
i am going to start my small presentation about the uh, the worst upcoming world ayurveda congress its present and upcoming program now i am screen share madam dekha jacche eta yes yes the visual perfect ছিলি <laughs> Uh, Shumit, please go ahead and and we'll see what we can do. I might need to stop yes. sharing your screen a couple of times if someone becomes belligerent. But we just kindly ask everyone who's here to not uh, hack today, okay? Por favor, please uh, do not hack the the slides. Dr. Shumit, please go ahead. Baspati ji, could you ask Sumit to restart his presentation to get rid of the red line on the bottom right hand uh, i think we should go ahead because right now i'm in the middle of um getting rid of a lot of people that are trying to hack so should we don't let anyone else in i'm not letting anyone in that we don't recognize their name sorry to say should we go ahead yes dekha jacche madam yes we can madam dekha jacche Yes. Presentation dekha jacche? Yes, let's speak in English and yes, I can see your screen. Perfect. Okay. Welcome again, uh, welcome all. Uh, today, uh, today I am going to present uh, the, about the ninth to upcoming ninth World Ayurveda Congress. Uh, this year the theme is uh, Ayurveda for One Health. World Ayurveda Congress, a global platform initiated uh, from the 2002 uh, for all the stakeholders for networking and engaging in intellectual exchange to strengthen the Ayurveda sector, reframe their sense of purpose and envision the future. World Ayurveda Congress showcases advance in uh, relevant fields, orient students, facilities interaction between professionals and consumers, thus the boosting Ayurveda commerce. Uh, the last at the uh, global uh, uh, the six world uh, ayurveda validatory address when prime minister narendra modi ji attended he told our effort are to uh, tap real potential of ayurveda and other ayush system in impacting preventive promotion holistic healthcare to people and uh, last he attended when uh, the global ayush festival uh, you know innovation uh, investment and innovation uh, Amit at um, uh, Gujarat, he told the next Amrit Kal, that is uh, this year, uh, uh, all you know that um, 75 years, uh, uh, the independence of 75 years going on in India. So next 25 years, he uh, decided to call the gov at government level, that is Amrit Kal. So, so uh, for future planning is going on, that is Amrit Kal. Uh, of next 25 years also uh, for very peak time for ayurveda also so he told uh, next 25 years will prove to be the golden period of traditional medicine uh, uh, to, to this is the ninth edition which we already crossed already the eighth edition we can go through for our last eighth edition Uh, this is the first World Health Congress uh, held at Kochi, Kerala, in 2002, where minister, at that time, Minister of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, and the Vigyan uh, Bharati, our mother organization, uh, the theme was the Ayurveda and World Health. That is the uh, at a glance, at the time, foreign delegates, uh, and uh, the number of delegates 1800 and foreign delegates was one, uh, 168 22 country was participated and at that uh, aragya expo 2 lakhs people visited the second world ayurveda congress 
uh, that was um, uh, at that time inaugurated by uh, Omubani Ramdas Ministry of Minister of Health. Uh, 2006, uh, uh, Pune and Maharashtra, uh, it was held. Organizer was the University of Pune, Vigyan Bharati, and the Ayush Department at then already uh, separately Ayush Department was formed. So Ayush Department uh, uh, was the uh, organizer. The theme was globalization of Ayurveda. Uh, at the time, uh, delegate attended 3,500 and the foreign delegate was uh, 220. The total country represented 30 and the 5 uh, lakhs people who were visited the Arogo Expo. That is third World Ayurveda Congress uh, that was inaugurated by Honor, uh, Honorable Secretary of Ayush Sri Jalaja Sina in uh, 2008, uh, which was held at Jaipur, Rajasthan. Uh, organizer was the national prestigious Institute, National Institute of Ayurveda, Vikyan Bharati and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, uh, Ayush Department, uh, Government of India. That theme was the mainstreaming of Ayurveda. At that time, 2,800 participants, uh, 222 foreign delegates, 36 countries, 2 lakh people um, attended at the Aragua Expo. The fourth World Ayurveda Congress uh, that was held at Karnataka uh, at uh, 2010, Bengaluru, Government of Karnataka and Government of India, uh, Ayush Department was Ayurveda for all, the theme was. 4,200 delegates, 264 foreign delegates, 26 country, and 3 lakhs people uh, participated. This is the fifth World Ayurveda Congress, uh, was inaugurated by, at that uh, time, Public Account Committee Chairman uh, Dr. Murli Manohar. Murli Manohar Joshi. Uh, at uh, Bhopal, uh, this program was conducted. Uh, the, the organizer was the World Ayurveda Foundation and Government of uh, Madhya Pradesh. Uh, theme was the enriching public health through Ayurveda. Fifth World Ayurveda Congress, uh, uh, 2,512 uh, participants, 85 foreign delegates, and 21 countries presented it. Uh, at fifth world I the Congress, fortunately, I met with Vasati Madam at first uh, 2012. A team of from our uh, West Bengal we went there first at that 2012. We met at first uh, sixth world I with Congress, and uh, that was the 2014 6 to 9 December. And fortunately, today the expansion of IU system uh, from India to near near about 36 country abroad. That is going on due to the creation of separate Ayush ministry, and this was uh, was done by uh, our honourable uh, Prime Minister. After uh, that, this uh, this is the uh, you are uh, in screen. Uh, this picture at that validatory function of uh, six World Ayurveda Congress and return back to PMO. This uh, decision was taken by him. Uh, and the IUS ministry was formed that is 9th December 2014 night at night that IUS ministry was formed and next morning it was declared. Uh, World Ayurveda Foundation at then Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Health Challenges and Ayurveda. This was the uh, theme. The total delegate attended 3,453, total foreign delegate was 114 and 33 country representative are also Expo visited by 3 lakhs people. This is the seventh World Ayurveda Congress. Uh, it was uh, arranged at our uh, city of Joy, Kolkata, uh, inaugurated by our Honorable uh, Ayush Minister uh, Sri Padu Yosana Aikji at Science City, Kolkata. It was organized by Ministry of at then as the Ministry was formed 2014. The organizer was Ministry of Ayush, Government of India, and World Ayurveda Foundation. The theme was the strengthening the Ayurveda ecosystem. As uh, our uh, Ayurveda has uh, the subjects and the liaisoning with and all other systems so the theme was the ayurveda ecosystem and the next what i will congress was and the, at the time 2400 participants 199 foreign delegates 18 country represented it 
8th World Ayurveda Congress uh, last uh, which uh, was uh, organized at uh, Ahmedabad uh, to December 2018. Ministry of Ayus and Government of India, World Ayurveda Foundation, realizing the focus on health. This is what the theme. The 4,201 uh, participants, 226 foreign delegates, that uh, 32 country and approximately 2 lakhs people were visited the A. Eh? Now we are coming to 9th World Ayurveda Congress. The theme is Ayurveda for One Health, which is going to held on 8 to 11 December 2022 at the Kola Academy, Panjim, Goa. This is the outer view of Kola Academy. This is the uh, venue, upcoming uh, program venue. Uh, the why uh, the focal theme is choice for Ayurveda uh, for One Health. The concept of One Health is a collaborative, interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral approach to the local, regional, national and global level with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes like disease prevention, surveillance, monitoring, control and mitigation as well as environmental conservation broadly. It is a sustainable approach towards achieving the goal of health for all because of its time-tested traditional knowledge and non-separable link with nature and lifestyle. Ayurveda system of healthcare has the capability to deliver quality that is promotive, preventive, rehabilitative and social community level healthcare. The new philosophy of healthcare is moving from illness to wellness from treatment to prevention and early diagnosis from the generalized approach to personalized medicine in a sustainable way. That is already mentioned in Ayurveda that is Sastasa Sastarakhanam Aturak Vikara Prasamanamcha. The who defines one health is approach to design and implementing programs, policies, legislation and research in work uh, which multiple sector communicate and work together to achieve better public health outcomes. The one health approach is critical to addressing health threats, the animal, the human and environmental interface. This is the, comp this is the uh, component. These are the component uh, for ninth uh, work. That is parallel session, inter international delegate assembly. That is the only for uh, specifically uh, program uh, for international uh, delegate. And the uh, plenary session, uh, conclave or seminars, Arugo fair, and the public outreach program. The, these are the main components uh, for our ninth world. That is proposed plenary session, I read for one health. Educational reforms in the light of national educational policy, uh, pandemic lessons for future Ayurveda research, innovation expanding horizons for One Health, environmental footprint of Ayurveda procedures, and the uh, achieving zero emission invited lectures. This is the uh, these are the theme uh, for um, uh, oral presentation. That is health um, uh, and environment facing pandemic with Ayurveda. Sky is the limit approaching of immunomodulation that is Rasayan in defense sector, space, sports and other areas. Ayurveda for public health, Ayurveda data science and omics, Ayurveda biology, integration with Indian traditional sciences, research method for Ayurveda concept, technology for Ayurveda, Ayus Ahar, dietics and food technology for Ayurveda, New avenues for Ayurveda pharmaceuticals, including development of quality and safety standard of Ayurveda drug. Probing surgical questions, Ayurvedic answers, manuscriptology, terminology, dietetics, and other aspects of literature research. Ayurveda heals success stories, Ayur cosmetology, Posu Ayurveda, commitment, compassion, and care. Uh, for this uh, matter, I am happy to inform you the, uh, that. So, uh, uh, last yesterday was the last date, but our uh, authority extend uh, the uh, decision that is up to 15 September. The date, the registration date, and the abstract submission date is extended up to 15 September. Uh, 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 last slide I am giving to all of you the uh, website. You all can visit and register yourself. With, you can present your abstract there. Associated events, that is seminar on medicinal plant, conclave on veterinary, uh, veterinary Ayurveda, 
uh, that is ncs and national uh, commission for indian system of medicine they are going to uh, organize principal conclave that is college principal conclave international delegate assembly arogyo international arogyo fair traditional healers meet uh, rashtriya ayurved vidya pj going to organize guru shishya meet program on ayurveda ahar program on innovation satellite seminars uh, that is uh, the, this uh, this uh, lecture is today this lecture is uh, under satellite one of the satellite event ayurveda film festival that is also declared uh, satellite seminar that is 20 physical satellite seminar and uh, near about uh, extra uh, near about 200 satellite seminar is going on uh, at india and abroad also that is uh, the, uh, this place or uh, out of india they say in this uh, the satellite seminar is going on south africa australia netherlands romania sri lanka serbia and singapore that is call for paper that is we are expecting this uh, time 2500 abstract oral presentation 250 uh, and poster presentation 400 this time we are uh, expecting uh, delegate registration we this time we are expecting 4500 delegates expected foreign delegates we are expecting 400 and country uh, for, uh, 45 plus that is uh, this uh, date is changed because of uh, that uh, in a submission of a strategy extended up to 15th uh, uh, september that is only uh, first line is changed 31st august is extended up to uh, 15th september uh, rest is uh, all are uh, same international arogyo expo uh, that is the expo is the Uh, showcase ayurveda achievement theme based uh, home pavilion maximize participation of stakeholders that is pharma uh, company and other uh, to invite state and central government organization to participate ministry of ayush quality council of india and csir pavilion to encourage international uh, representation ayush excel pavilion ayurveda colleges to include medicinal plant sector nmpb pavilion national medicinal plant board to provide ayush healthcare ayush aragyo clinics for free medical checkup that is uh, layout our uh, aragyo expo uh, that is venue uh, this is the uh, our upcoming uh, venue this is the institutional partner that is uh, partner state that is already conducted uh, previously uh, that is government of kerala government of maharashtra rajasthan government of karnataka government of madhya pradesh government of west bengal and government of gujarat the institutional partner and associates also uh, they are uh, thank you uh, thank you all for uh, uh, listening my uh, presentation carefully this is the uh, uh, website that is iuol.org uh, uh, everyone uh, here i uh, will request to search this uh, website and go through this uh, details uh, for and i will request everyone uh, to, for Uh, submitting your uh, abstract uh, within 15 september and registered you will set to we hopefully we all will meet uh, at 8th december at goa thank you thank you all chumit do you want to introduce uh, this talk you want to introduce me at all uh, yes now we are uh, going to now we are going to start uh, our today presentation that is uh, in this slide i already mentioned uh, that is uh, uh, one of the uh, policy is our education policy that is as per uh, our uh, national education policy nep uh, this time uh, we also uh, thinking that uh, when i talked about uh, bhaswati madam that what should be our today's topics uh, madam uh, various topics we discussed then madam uh, uh, topics uh, uh, made that preserving ayurveda's vidya with education based practices what should we our um, for uh, few uh, for the generation next generation that uh, the when we are planning for educational reforms in ayurveda sector what should be the next uh, so madam Uh, please uh, madam now um, is fellowship director at ayurveda iub indica academy which is our 
today one of the uh, co-host of this program indica academy and iub uh, also madam uh, clinical associate professor of medicine will corneal medical college new york usa madam now is at usa uh, so uh, madam please uh, hello dr sumit yes uh, hello uh, ha bolu uh, ha uh, uh, sumit before madam telling us please uh, ha uh may i say something just just um, uh, for two or three minutes okay uh first of all to good evening to everyone uh, uh there is a one problem because man i am just bms graduate madam just uh, can you hear hello yes yes yes, yes. Uh, tell me Yes, so and continue. I am just BMS graduate, so I am not. Uh, I am not like uh, those. You are the scholar researcher from the issue also, and you have uh, definitely uh, studied internal medicine. Uh, and I uh, uh, already watched your uh, one time shakshakar with uh, Dr. Kunal Bhattacharya with uh, uh, Kunal Sarkar. Yes. Uh, there is something in our bms undergraduate policy there are very much parameters that those dhatu mol and uh, uh, and with these parameters we can assess the patient that in, in which character he or she is and then by podhat application we can uh, choose a drug but there is a we are in uh, in this process we are in that because when uh, when i um, uh, do ayurvedic chamber to my and do ayurvedic uh, patients with diabetes but sometimes at uh, giving basant kusumakar ros or the other drug which has already uh, stated in our sanghita but uh, the action is not so uh, so do you have a question uh, so i he just want to say that that uh, uh, may we all together make a uh, software to mane integrate all these those dhatu mol nari vigyan all these things in a at the integrated way that's why we all we all those who are bms who are over the bms that md medicine also ha huh? but okay in, in uh, treating the patients ha huh, with uh, a very uh, so do you efficient. have a question because you know uh, i'm going to be talking about education best practices and it seems that uh, it'll be more useful for you if you listen and then maybe if we have time for discussion or you can write to me personally because right here i think people on the talk uh, might want to listen to the topic of the talk first Okay. Yeah, is it okay, Dr. Mitra? I'm happy okay. to talk with you afterwards about integrated. There are several groups that are doing IT projects and apps, like you're talking about, for integrating the best of all kinds of medicine. That's why the theme of WAC is um, uh, One Health. So. if you could listen that would be great yeah if you have any other quick comments please otherwise i will well, start my presentation thank you so much thank okay you. okay i don't want to be rude and so i um yeah i i just uh, wanted to do that um i'd like to ask if um i can find someone who can manage to be a co-host with me i'm going to choose margaret Motte, because i know that margaret already knows how to do this margaret is that okay with you can you unmute and say it because i need a co-host who knows how to run zoom margaret okay i don't yes doctor it to be a pleasure okay thank you very much margaret i'm making you a co-host if you can just make sure that no one comes into the room who is a potential uh, you know um hacker great so let me begin uh i uh you can see the slides i think everyone and i'm pleased to be here i have attended several of the wac 
uh, events. And as Shumit mentioned, we met at one of them. And I'm very happy to share with you some of the work that we have started, which is to find a global standard for teaching Ayurveda outside of India. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have any concern for India, but India already has laws for how uh, Ayurveda can be taught through the NMC, which was the CCIM. And so rather than working with that, plus we all know how most BAMS graduates feel about the curriculum. They are not so pleased with it. And despite biannual reforms, there seems to be some kind of gap. So we know this because of many different uh, Vaidyas who have other training in addition to BAMS, and they will convey what really works. So we've been collecting from different Vaidyas the best practices in the education of Ayurveda. We are not talking about modern medicine here, and we're not talking about public health. We're talking about Ayurveda, but with the theme of Ayurveda for addressing health, not just uh, Swastya uh, Rakshanam and, oh, Ayurveda is good for wellness and only for prevention. But Ayurveda is good for health promotion, health maintenance, disease prevention, and intervention of disease, which is called cure or treatment of disease. This is very important to remember that WHO and many groups like the uh, Integrative Medicine Group at the European Commission and the All Parliamentary Party in the UK, they have all been looking at what health is so that they can improve the healthcare systems. So I begin uh, today, you know, we are in the middle of Ganesh Chaturthi. So we ask for Ganesh. We should have done this prayer in the beginning to get the hackers out. And Ganesh always reminds us to be allowing of all people, uh, even those who are other. So we want to tell the hackers that please don't hack anymore. Please, uh, if you're out, you know, great. If you're here, please sit and listen. And we include you as well so that you don't try to sabotage our, our talk. So Om. Ganesham Om Ganapati Namaha. So for all of you, uh, welcome to Ganesh Chaturthi. I also begin with obeisance to all of my teachers and my gurus because they have taught me the best practices in Ayurveda and how to, um, oh, is there someone with some background noise, Margaret, if you can help me or Sumit. Um, so if we look at the people who taught us. So if you think back to, here's my mother, think about your mother, your teachers, who taught you to actually learn things successfully? How do you know what you know? And how do you know that those things that you have learned are um, effective, useful, and make you more competent? And that is the principle around which we should work. So all of these people have been instrumental in my life. So with this theme of Ayurveda for One Health and this shloka that I mentioned, swastasya, swastya, rakshanam, there's also the aturasya, the, the comprehensive treatment of disorders, aturasya, vikara, prasamana, macha. And in English, that is about the doshas, the agni, the ama, and the terms that Dr. Ayan Mitra was mentioning, that it's so important to have that in there. How do we do that? I don't think the BAMS curriculum, uh, having analyzed it in detail, I don't think it really does that. So what I was starting with is how do you preserve Ayurveda's vidya? So that's the title of this talk. What is vidya? Vidya is not just knowledge. This is from the Monier Williams Dictionary, but it is true knowledge. It is the vidya of what is true knowledge. How do you know what's true knowledge? By the competence of its use in practice or in diagnosis or in treatment. And if it doesn't work, then is it actual vidya? The ancient rishis and writers of the Ayurvedic texts that have survived. Remember, there are thousands that were written. Many of them didn't survive because the doctors that used them said, this doesn't work. So the ones that actually were oral and then captured into written form were things that worked for the clinicians and the everyday scientists who were looking at the cause and the effect at the uh, provision of a food, a lifestyle change, an oshadam, herbal or mineral, and seeing whether or not that worked. If it worked, that was what was captured into these texts that we read today that we call the granthas or the shastras. And that is Vidya, the true knowledge. So I want to take you through just a few best practices 
and then take you through an experiential because some of the best practices are for those of you who are educationists who might not have an actual Ayurvedic degree and might find uh, interesting as an overview, a bird's eye view. But I also want to take you through what I experienced um, in medicine. And I didn't want to make this personal, but there's no other way to do it because education is personal. And my experience as an educationist in the ways that I've learned has really affected the way I um, am able to teach. So uh, I'll just share with you a handful of best education practices. Um, the first one is to translate proper terminology of Ayurveda using examples from nature or food or the body, and not to say guru is heavy. Because if you look at the commentaries of, for example, the Ashtanga Hridayam, this is from um, Arunadatta, he, he doesn't consider these gunas, the gurvadi gunas or the vimshadi gunas, the 20 gunas. He doesn't consider them as nouns or adjectives. He considers them as karmani shakti, right? So there's an action power of a particular word. And if you understand that these words are actually coming from dhatus that are actions, then you will not say guru is heavy. You will say guru comes from the verb brahmane, which means to nourish, to bring into the material form from the avyak to the vyak, from the energy level to the matter level, and therefore to grow and expand the tissues and to nourish them, will, they will expand. So the bulk added to tissues is brahmane, that is the verb. So in this case, when we always say guru is heavy, the translation of the word heavy in English and then into other languages, Spanish, French, Portuguese, whoever is learning, it becomes a wrong translation, a limited translation. Why? Because contextually, guru, in this case of the body, for example, the herb might be a guru or a food might be guru, doesn't mean that it's heavy, right? But it could be very heavy to digest. So kale might be light as a, as a leaf or some kind of lettuce might be light as, light as a leaf, but it is heavy to digest for the body. So it's still guru. It is not light, lagu. So we have to learn that the proper terminology is there. This is a challenge for people who don't uh, teach in their first language, but one of the best practices is to find this terminology. There are uh, efforts by different groups such as Ayush who are trying to convey uh, these kind of terminology uh, translations, but because Sanskrit is a contextual language, the best is just to use examples from nature. So when you say laghu for a cloud, it's different from laghu from that lettuce that I mentioned, or laghu from a different um, context of what you are trying to convey with the gunas. So we can come back to that if we have time for uh, questions, but I just wanna introduce that as a important feature. The second is to teach from the actual texts. So. One of the things that the American Association of Ayurvedic Professionals is doing is putting together a curriculum for all BAMS who want to practice outside of India. And what we tend to do is default to these texts that are written as English translations. But as I speak to students who are on the receiving end of that, students mostly in the USA, but also in Europe and at the Dinacharya Masterclasses where we have people from Australia and New Zealand and China and Singapore and India and the US and all over Europe and all over South America. We have students that are understanding in English, but when they read the books, they're not getting the full context. And so what we say is whatever you do, teach from the text. So in this case, the example I've shown is from one of our slides of Dinacharya Masterclass, where we go shloka by shloka for understanding ahara, which means we translate it as food, but ahara means that which we take in. So it can be energy, it can be air, it can be uh, drink, it can be um, uh, love, it can be scolding. Anything that you take in is ahara. It's not food. Anna means more of a food context, but we tend to say ahara means food. So when we explain the terms like that, and then we go shloka by shloka through and we show how uh, in this case, Vagbata showed the different types of foods, we get a different understanding and students walk away from these classes with an aha because they never understood Ayurvedic nutrition. 
We also performed this, did this in uh, the Indica series, IUVE and Indica courses. You can go to iuve.in to read more. Dr. Shumit has written some articles there. And you can go to indica.in to see the kind of work that Indica Academy is doing toward vidya and toward teaching people in a real, um, we can say a real context of best practices for actual Ayurvedic education. The third is to keep herbs in mind. Now, obviously we are teaching herbs, but we don't know how to teach the herbs in a way that is effective if you go and speak with many, many uh, students. They will say, it was just alphabet soup to me. I've never heard of many, I've never heard of Gulwell and Jatamamsi. Most have heard of Jatamamsi, but I've never heard of many of these herbs. So what do we do? So to teach it knowing the audience. So not to say that Tej Patra is bay leaves because they're not, they're a totally different plant, but to say like bay leaves, which is the Italian version, Tej Patra is the cinnamon genus and it has more of a sweet pungent nature unlike bay leaves, which has more of just a pungent nature, and give them what they understand and attach to it so they can have something to hook that new piece of knowledge onto. So we use products that are available in the US. So I hold up products and I say, look, this is uh, how we can understand this from what you know. We use tours in gardens if we're in India, and I invite all people that are learning Ayurveda to go and find some gardens and an Ayurvedic Dravya Guna expert. And we use experiential. So when I teach in the master classes, we have the herbs in, some of them are in raw form if we can get them, otherwise they're in powder form, which are widely available in the US. And we have them tasted because the way that the Rishis understood the herbs was through the organoleptics. They would look at it. They would listen to how crunchy, dry or moist or squishy it was. They would smell it. They would feel how it, was and they would use the gunas to describe it. Is it heavy or light in feeling? And then they would taste it and experience the rasas. And that is how they experience the herbs. So we encourage teaching like that. And I think any of you who are teachers understand that herbs is a very big part of really um, explaining Ayurveda. This is a list because I'm sure that we wouldn't get through uh, all of these in detail. <laughs> this is some of the gold standards that have been um, some of the practices that have been offered from people all around the world who are educationists. They're either teaching or they are experts because they've been through a lot of education in different places. And they are saying things that we want in Ayurvedic education that we are not getting in a useful or accurate way that is aligned with Vidya. Saying that, I will say that the best way to learn is problem-based thinking, critical thinking, and uh, the best style of doing is Gurukul. So for those of you who think that um, Gurukul is not available, I'll just let you know that Gurukul is coming back in terms of some of these best practices called problem-based learning. And I'm going to take you through a, a part of a case of that. So problem-based learning is a learning method where you use a problem as a starting point, and then you teach around that. So I think this pyramid is a little bit small to see but, um, oh, we're not getting this. Um, but uh, let's see if I can increase the size of this so you can see it. So you want to teach. So these are the different things about learning. And what we find is that if you teach others what you learn, that's a really great way of learning and practicing is a really great way. But sitting in lectures is not a very good tool for learning. And so we need to move away from lectures Having said that, I will uh, share with you that I was one of the very fortunate people that never had a single lecture in medical school. I was part of an experimental program that was all problem-based and case-based learning. So taking that to Ayurveda, one of the practices is Mukha Mukha. So at AVP, where my guru was, we started the day with Mukha Mukha. So we would show a shloka. We would then show the transliteration for people who can't read in Hindi, which is all of South India, you know, only 40% of people in India can uh, speak Hindi. So we would give the Mukha Mukha every morning so they would hear the shloka, the effect of the dhatus of the, the accurately pronounced Sanskrit would have an effect. And they would hear it like a song. So if I say for most Westerners, Mary had a little lamb, most people can just say the entire song and sing it to a tune. 
why you know 30 40 50 60 years later you can do that because it's in your ear from muka mukam because you learn mary had a little lamb little lamb so you know that tune that tune is called a chandas a metric and if we learn these shlokas through muka mukam so we get to memorize it it becomes so automatic and they become like encyclopedic reference points so if i say how was the lamb? Someone will say, oh, the fleece was white as snow. They have that access. And I'm giving a Western example because there are many people here who have had Western uh, context. We could do the same thing with, uh, you know, Gopal and the cow, uh, Gopal and Guru. We can do it in different regional languages. But in this case, we would every morning have Dushyam Desham Balam Kalam Anala Prakriti Vaya Satma Satva Satma Satmiya tata ahara avastasya avastascha uh, parta vidyaha. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. And if it's done accurately by an actual professor who knows Sanskrit and the students learn it, they learn it very well. I've learned the 10 words because I use them in daily practice. And that mukamukam is something that is easily doable in BAMS. Uh, colleges, but it's not done. And the question is, why is it not done when it's such an effective way of learning, as we know from nursery rhymes and childhood um, things that we've learned. So since I won't get into each of these uh, in detail, let me move into this problem based thinking, because I think it's a central tenet of how we can integrate Ayurvedic education for one health. And so the definition, as I said before, comes to me, um, I did learn in this method, and there are several schools in the US that are doing this. Now, the ones that are creating the curriculum, I'm gonna be a little critical here, are usually people who are not trained in different health sciences. They have only had an MBBS and they've been put on the, you know, the, the transition committee or the education committee, or because you know, in India, the MBBS person is still thought to have a superior education in many places or their BAMS graduate who's learned Ayurveda, but has only learned that. They haven't learned from different curricula. So they think that the way medical school should be is two years of preclinical and two years of clinical. But if you come to the best curricula around the world, and there are many, I've just taken two of them. One is the Zucker School, which is in a, a part of New York State. And they just got away with anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, uh, microbiology, all these topics. And they talked about systems. So they have several components. And the, if you think about a year as 50 weeks, so the first 100 weeks is the first two years of medical school. And they teach in terms of health and disease, that idea of one health. So the first part, which I love, is that in the first six months of the schooling, they get into first year of medical school, they do a EMT, emergency, that, sorry, emergency medical technician certification. That way they are licensed health professionals. They can take care of emergency situations. They feel like a, a health professional who can intervene. And because they have that certification, they are thinking, this is an allopathic curriculum, but they're thinking about problem, solution, problem, solution. And it gives them confidence. They get clinical experience. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of clinical experience. And so one of the things in the gold standard document, that white paper that we're writing, is that we are going to demand that every student that comes into a Ayurvedic training outside of India has at least six months of clinical experience volunteering in a hospital or through some uh, licensed health profession that they're already a part of. So they know what it is to interact with patients. We can go through these one by one, but I'll just take you through the other curriculum and then into the case. So this is their second week, oh, sorry, um, I missed something here. This is the second hundred weeks. So this is the third and fourth year. And again, even though it's in the rotation format, there's a lot of integration that goes on. There's a lot of preparation for further, deeper, stronger levels of integration rather than components. And so it looks like components here, but there's a lot of this stuff here, this integration. Another curriculum, which is at my home college is the Wild Cornell Medical College curriculum. They've got, done away with um, classes in anatomy, physiology, microbiology, uh, pharmacology, pathology. It's in, 
essential principles and they're all case based and they're all group based, all of them. So one case might emphasize some condition that's a genetic condition in which drugs were tried and in which there's a cellular basis, a tissue basis in which you learn the anatomy through a radiology scan that was in that case. And those cases take them through learning a meshwork of different kinds of information. If you can take this analogy from modern allopathic schooling to Ayurveda, it just makes sense for anyone that's learned through Gurukul. So in Gurukul, there is a wonderful example, which is the Aryavaidya pharmacy example. They're actually doing this now in a modified format, but back in the 1980s, they had a residential program where students would come in and they would learn an integrated format of doshas, dhatus, srotas, mala, am, agni. And rather than saying doshas and dhatus are for kriya sharir and learning the organs is rachna sharir and uh, you only learn about drugs in the bhaisaja kalpana, they integrated everything and they lived in a forest where they could learn together. Today, that curriculum, and by the way, the teachers of that seven year program, there were only um, a few cohorts of that eight or 10 cohorts. Those are among India's best vaidyas that are at the forefront and also in the back of running a lot of the Ayurvedic education reform because they know how they learned. So today, if you wanna participate in that in a small way, since they don't have the whole um, BAMS curriculum that way, because it's not allowed by the, you know, the powered authorities, what they have are intensive residential programs like the Poprakashini, which I participated in, um, I think four or five times. It's a very intense 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. program. It's very intense. And it includes getting up in the morning, having puja, yoga, food, mukha mukham, and then interacting and having cases. And they do have lecture format, but it's uh, more interactive than a straight lecture that you see in most Indian schools. They also have several other programs like Karma Prakashini and Ayugotra, and you can see that there are many, many people that are interested in this kind of format. So let me take you through a couple of examples in these last few minutes. One is the way that I teach the gunas. And I'm using the gunas as an example so that you can um, see how it is done. So what I do is I draw these 10 pyramids and I just draw a couple of the answers to help people get started. These are the three main gunas in which, uh, three sets of gunas in which um, I would say 80 to 85% of the diagnosis and treatment can be done. I've done it in English because we did this with a group of people who are not all Hindi speaking and not Sanskrit speaking. And this was one of the first exercises before they had learned Ushna, Shita, Ruksha, uh, Snigdha, Laghu, Guru, which are these six that I've written here. And I had people come up to the board in an interactive way to learn. So I wasn't teaching, I was asking them to do it. And this is what it looked like. So they came up and they put words up here. So cold is Hima and Shita. Some people understand cold as being Hima and Shita. And shita does not mean cold. It means that which contracts. So we talked about the actual Sanskrit meaning of shita and of ushna, and we gave the English equivalent. And then we put in the pancha mahabhuta, so you can see space, uh, air, fire, water, earth. And then we put in the vata, the pitta, and the kapha, where it ranks in there. And we drew the line. So here's the pitta across these 10 gunas. And as we did this, we were able to help students contrast and understand the gunas better. And because this was an interactive exercise, it was really fun for the students. And they said that they were relearning uh, gunas. These were all BAMS students who did this. So they were relearning gunas for the first time in this deeper way, which they hadn't gotten. And they certainly hadn't gotten this kind of way of learning because they had forgotten to go back to the karma of the gunas. So this is one way. Now, another way is to learn by what I showed earlier, problem-based learning. And that is that it's a self-directed learning where they're in a group, but they are responsible for identifying the problem, identifying how to analyze the problem, and then identifying how to find the resources that will help them. So there are lecture-based cases 
There are actual immersion cases and there are some modified ways of doing this problem-based learning. And so um, if you look at an actual case, let me take you through just the first three or four slides. So here is a patient, and I just chose this quickly because it's one of the first ones I found. I'm actually developing an entire book of cases in Ayurveda that I would love to have students use. So um, if we look at, there's a noise in the background, one second. Uh, Dr. Shulmit, if you can unmute, or sorry, if you can mute yourself, and also Margaret, if you can mute yourself, that would be great. Yes, ma'am. Please mute yourself. There's some background noise. So in this first case, we have, uh, sorry about this, you guys, there's some noise. Uh, in this first case, so we just present the patient. This is a clinical situation. Obviously, it's not a physical patient, but for the first year student, they can think about this. A 24-year-old woman presents to the clinic. So you know it's the clinic and not the inpatient hospital or the uh, emergency room. She's complaining that she hasn't had a menstrual period in five months. She doesn't feel as though she used uh, that, uh, that she has as much energy as she used to. And prior to the five months, her periods were regular and light with minimal discomfort. So what we do is we take a first year student, we say, what do you understand? 50% of the patients, if they are women, will say, okay, I understand what a menstrual period is. Some of the men do, some of the men don't. This means that there's a differential learning curve. So we have to figure out who these patients, uh, sorry, who these students are and how they would interact with the patient. So we first do questions. So we take the data. So I just took a part of the data, which is 24 year old woman, prior to five months, her periods were regular. She is uh, having minimal discomfort. She doesn't have as much energy. So we write out all the data on the board. There's a scribe and there's someone that's reading and all the, there are usually six students in the class and one facilitator. Facilitator usually stays quiet. So the six students learn how to take the data and present them and they'll write them on a board where everyone can see it. That's the data, number one. Then they ask questions. So if we were doing this as an exercise, we could ask the question, why hasn't she had a period in five months? Um, what does it mean being a 24 year old versus a 54 year old or a 14 or a 12 year old? Um, what are the other questions you would ask about menstruation? What is the reason that she has? Is it normal not to have a period in five months? What are the things you're thinking of? And usually someone will say, is she pregnant? Because that's one of the questions that should come up. Maybe you didn't think of that question or maybe you thought of it first, but the group pulled all their questions together. And then they come up with hypotheses and they banter about them. Well, if she's pregnant, no, wait, she says she hasn't had enough, a lot of energy. She doesn't say anything else. Well, she doesn't say that she's pregnant. Well, she says she's only had minimal discomfort. Shouldn't she have had um, some vomiting and discomfort? No, not all women have that. So this is students who don't have clinical experience with their own hypotheses from their life experience. They're taking what they know and adding to it. And I did this case uh, series with Ayurvedic physicians at an MD level, they were at BHU, and it was fascinating to see how they analyzed the case. We also did it with first year Ayurveda students and saw. Now, what we next do is take them through learning issues. So they do the first page of analysis and then they get the second page. She has recently noticed a crusty grayish discharge from her vagina. Why are we saying this? Because they need to get used to the anatomical parts of the woman and not be shy. This is part of sexual education, which many times uh, they come from places where they're taught that you know, certain words are embarrassing or wrong. And being doctors, they need to get used to that. We talk about intercourse. She enjoys sex. However, intercourse has recently been painful. She does not lubricate. She has noticed her hair is thinning. So now they started identifying their learning issues. So I just kept the date in there because uh, that's when they did it. So they asked, well, what is primary and secondary amenorrhea? They asked, what is a normal menstrual cycle? Oh, I don't know. What are the different phases? Well, according to modern medicine, there's a luteal phase, the follicular phase, a menstrual period phase. What is it in Ayurveda? Oh, we don't know. We need to go to some kind of book. Where will we go? So first they identify the learning issues. And then they go to the resources that they would learn from. So 
here's their working hypotheses. And I think I didn't include the learning issues. Yeah. So they would go and they would say, and these are the people that were assigned it. So Shorab said, I will go and look up the cause of vaginal dryness. Anam said, I will go and look up the causes of thinning hair. Um, and uh, what are the, why would someone have pain during sex? Many of the Indian patients have never had sex when they come to this case. Many American students have never had sex. So how do you discuss this? They learn so many different lessons in the same case-based situation and they learn how to deal with their own personal lack of knowledge as well as um, what they do know and can offer to the group and help the group learn. I've just looked at the clock and it's uh, four minutes past the ending. Can I have permission to continue for a few more minutes? Is that okay? Can, can people uh, just give me a yes or a no? Do you need me to stop? Yes, okay, Anai says yes. Dr. Bijlani, may I continue? Yes? Yes, up? please, please do. Okay, yeah, please good. do. I'll just continue for a few more minutes. And so uh, we take this case and then we move to the next, which is next more information, but they first should exhaust learning that case and learning everything they can. And they're pulling in from Kriya Sharia, Rachna Sharia, they're learning about their different drugs, they're asking questions, did she use something? Maybe she had an overdose of something, what's her Agni? What's her uh, weight? What's her Ama? Okay, how would you identify Ama? What are the ways you can understand Ama? And so they would themselves, they said, well, look at this. She hasn't had a menstrual period and she says she doesn't have as much energy. That might be a sign of ama. Why else would she not have energy? Because if a person has good uh, ojas, they should have good energy. And she did have regular periods before, which means that she didn't have that much difficulty in her body. So they're identifying pieces of information that will give them a way of understanding uh, what's going on. So then you read the next part of the case and you do the same thing. Prior to five months ago, she had nice ordinary hair. What is ordinary? So then you have to ask that. Her history reveals no major illness, illnesses. That means she's had good development through her life. She's taking no medications. So they analyze this again, going through the data, the questions, the hypotheses, and then what they need to learn. And they go to their textbooks and they come back for the next part. So that's usually this takes an hour, hour and a half to go through all of this. When they come back, here's just the second. This actually has five parts. So further history reveals. So first they come back and we go through those six people presenting what they know and then modifying hypotheses, getting new learning issues, looking again at the data, the first three pages and saying, no, this is not possible. Yes, this is possible. And then saying, okay, she's got gas and constipation. So what do we need? We need to have a pregnancy test. We need to have this, we need to have this. So from that, they're able to analyze the case. And by doing this, they learn so much more that in the course of, it's usually about um, 15 cases over 20 weeks of school. And those 15 cases are cross-disciplinary and they guide the students to learn what they don't know and to teach each other. And it ends up being such an effective, this is actually how I learned, this ends up being a fantastic way to learn. And I think because the Shastras are set up as multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary texts, that this would be the best way to learn. We do know that there is a um, uh, tendency for modern, sorry, for Ayurvedic education professionals to really hang on to what the uh, MBBS people are doing and model it. In fact, the Udupa Commission that created the curriculum for CCIM used the Udupa was at BHU. And so they used what was in the Institute of Medical Sciences in the modern medical side to create something on the Ayurvedic side. And they broke it up to specialties. Before that, people learned through Gurukul in an interdisciplinary way. So my uh, guru uh, teacher who was Vaidya Thirumulpad, Raghavan Thirumulpad, he would teach in an integrated way. He did not split things up, even though he understood that students were learning in a split way. And this ended up being in a very effective way to integrate education. Now I'm going back and forth between medical education 
and Ayurvedic education. But if you can learn the concept of doshas and dhatus from the beginning in a case, and someone says, well, it's obvious that that woman had problems with apanavayu, then the others will say, well, what is apanavayu? Okay, so apanavayu is one of five vayus, but actually they're not five, they're just different parts of the same. So why are we talking about apana? Oh, because these are issues in the hips and apana focuses on the pelvis and the hips. Wonderful. So they're learning to integrate the understanding of vata in a contextual way from the beginning due to these cases. So between clinical exposure and the ability to talk about these cases, I think it's a superior way for learning Ayurveda. It also, you know, there's discussions of ethics in there because they will say, well, no, you can't go and examine that patient. You need to have a female in the room because that's part of chaperoning. It also allows for local practices. In the USA, you have to have a female chaperone. Maybe there are countries where you don't. It allows women to think about their own menstrual periods as uh, people becoming doctors, but also working with cases and learn about their own body and self-care. It also allows them to learn how to say, no, you're wrong, or what you just presented is not correct from the book. And learn to, learn to say, well, what you learned is not what I learned. This is a different way of learning and learning how to give feedback, how to take feedback, which is really not taught in the BAMS curriculum. There's a lot of things written in this particular slide that um, I think we will go into in the white, uh, the white paper and the report. And I welcome any of you who are interested in Ayurveda education uh, to write to me personally so that you can be part of the evaluation and the construction of this gold standard report that is hopefully going to influence everyone learning Ayurveda outside of India, but also to those people who are in charge of the transformation in India, who maybe could be doing a more robust job of looking at what else is out there in the world and um, making that uh, more, you know, more, um, what should we say, available to the people who really want to learn Ayurveda. So I have put my email address here. I welcome you to write to me and I hope that uh, you have enjoyed this presentation. At the risk of going over time, I would like to um, ask if there are any questions. Dr. Sumit, if you will permit, we can just have a few minutes of questions and then end. Um, Does anyone have any questions? I see two hands up. Dr. Sumit, shall I take a question? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. ma'am. Uh, Bidhan Nursery, do you have a question? Your hand is up. Who is Bidhan Nursery? Bidhan Nursery ke? Speak in English, Sumit. <laughs> He's speaking in Bangla, which I understand, but uh, okay, we'll go over Bidhan Nursery because he's removed his hand. Dr. Abhijit Patra, do you have a question? Uh, Dr. Abhijit, do you want Abhijit to answer? Abhijit da. Do you have a question? We'll just give him one minute to come to, nope, he's removed his hand. I guess his question is done. Dr. Madan Tangavelu, do you have a question? Absolutely, thank you very much for elaborating so clearly how you could convey integrating the principles of Ayurveda with a bottom-up kind of teaching system. This is not only for Ayurveda, but it might also, what you're presenting here might also be useful for our um, modern medicine education in India. So that's point number one. So what you're offering is not just for Ayurveda and the Ayush systems, but also for modern medicine education in India. It as I still... received, right? As I received in the US. Yes, exactly. So, you know, we are at a time in the world where every corner of the world is within reach. Like right now, I'm talking to you today from Brussels. I'm seated here in Brussels. And thank you for sharing the link. I could join and I could enjoy your presentation. Number two, what you have offered for Ayurveda is also good for all the Ayush system. So this is a recommendation. So it should go into yoga, it should go into Yunani, it should go into Siddha, it should go into homeopathy. Homeopathy may be a little ahead in this respect, and it must go into uh, Tibetan. So Now, that's one point. The third one is the model you have offered is extremely useful 
for enabling a dialogue between the many systems. Yes, for the bridge courses especially, right? Yes. And so that is very important. It's very important to highlight that, that when you bring together, we are starting to see the need for integrating many systems in medicine, not only the IU systems, but we are also wanting with India taking leadership of the WHO Global Center for Traditional Meds in, uh, in Jamnagar, it becomes very, very important that we enable a model like this to teach people who will be coming to India to learn about global systems for traditional medicine, how they can take lessons, what you're proposing for Ayurveda into their lands, you know, you have uh, Chinese medicine, you will have uh, uh, Japanese, you will have the Kampo medicine, you will have Sesank medicine coming from Korea, you will have systems coming from Africa. They will all come to India soon to learn about these things. So what you're proposing is very, very important for the future, uh, for, for that aspect of um, education. Thank you. In Do terms you of clinical. Questions? in terms of clinical stuff. So I'm saying the same logic in my chat box. I put a comment here saying the same logic should yes. also go into the other domains. Yes. So you presented here a proposal for clinical perspectives, but the same could go for into health promotion. How do you understand? Into health maintenance. How do you understand this logic? Somebody says, I'm healthy. What can I do right now? I'm getting older, you know. I'm 40 in 10 years time, I'm gonna be 50. I'm healthy now, what should I be doing? That yeah. could also be a scenario, you see? Somebody can, right. so we have areas where dietary interventions, messages can come in. We have you know, areas where Ritu Sandhi is something, a very rich concept that can come. And it can so, be integrated in the yes, space. You know, all we have to do is add one phrase in the data that we give about the patient and you can actually insert one of those areas that is public health, or you want to put yoga in there, you can say that she does Pavan Mukha, in this case, she does Pavan Muktasana every day. So then that forces the students to actually take Pavan Muktasana and understand what is it, what's the Sanskrit word, what does the terminology refer to, and what is the yoga uh, exactly. you know, use of it. So there are many ways to alter these cases, the same case, and make it applicable for different medical um, systems, as you said, the Ayush, you know, the eight legal medical systems of India, but for people around the world to take it and compare it to Kampo if they're in Japan or to, you know, um, Native American medicine if they're in Mexico or in Canada or US. So it's a, it's a template that we can use, but we need to get people to understand how it is a superior template to the preclinical clinical that most people today who are in charge um, you know what they're trying to propagate out in the education quote unquote reforms because the reforms are not working they're not producing vaidyas that feel astoundedly impressed by their education they're usually surviving it and tolerating it and they're not enjoying it we are so very happy that's what very happy to see professor bijlani here with us yes. and i just i just want to just for professor bijlani's sake i just want to say you know showing people the link between shirsasan and say uh, something like tachycardia, you know, so baroreceptors in the carotid and how doing a simple maneuver actually provides a health promoting aspect to things. So there is a way in which you can do. That. So actually what Madan is talking about because Madan is a scientist with a PhD is that development of critical thinking, right? So to take any component and say, how does this get implicated for this and to think more critically is really missing. I'm not saying the shloka shouldn't be memorized at all, but you know, because having that mukha mukham is great, but to understand that critical thinking is missing in the BAMS curriculum helps us understand why MD and PhD students are parroting and they're not doing more quality research. When people ask for research studies, most of the people that I encountered during my many years at BHU were unable to construct experiments because they're not taught critical thinking. And this case-based learning, problem-based learning, even that gunas exercise where they come up to the board and, and participate and give deeper meanings and contrast and compare really, really helps. And I've never seen anyone use that pyramid system 
to put the gunas with the doshas and the panchamabhutas and compare them to each other and then show how uh, vata pitta kapha translates to the examples in food, in the human body, in nature, and then they really understand the gunas. Um, I'll take another question. Thank you for your input, Dr. Madan. Uh, Sujata Guha. Thank you, Madanji. Uh, Sujata, madam, uh, your question, please. Okay. Um, I have a question. I, I want to thank you for your presentation. It was really helpful. Um, one of the things I have found uh, in BMS teaching or whatever in Ayurveda, whether it's in the West or in India, is that we are trained to think in the modern system way, right? So we learn anatomy and physiology and so on that way through high school. And then when one gets to the uh, to Ayurveda, the whole conceptual system is quite different from the Ayurvedic, uh, from the modern system. So um, I'm actually in charge of developing a curriculum for children up, up to the 10th grade. And um, in India, to in uh, outside of Kolkata. Okay. So um, I have been trained in the US, by the way. I have a PhD in molecular biology, but I'm also a classmate of Schumitz. Uh, so I did my BMS at a very advanced stage. Um, so um, so it's to me, it's very interesting because I've had training in both systems, and that our minds are developed in a certain way and then to have to switch over to another way of thinking has, is very difficult. And well, what you're that's saying why it's not propagated, right? That's why it's not propagated right. because right. people can't switch over who are the teachers. Right. Well, um, you know, I mean, where you were just talking about critical thinking, you know, in the modern sense, because that's a lot of reductionism and I really requires all of that reductionism as well as holistic thinking. So um, so it takes, you know, I've been thinking very deeply about how to present Ayurveda to little kids because I'm going from six to 16 year olds. And I think that's something that one needs to think about. And that happens to students in India also because they go from a very modern system of learning to a very different system of learning. And of course, because I faced it in a very bad way because I was trained entirely in the West. And then I had to readjust to thinking differently. So anyway, I'd like your comments on what to do for younger kids, you know, and if it's possible to integrate it into Western schooling systems, you yes. know, to have yes, introductions. So yes. first, you know, uh, it's pretty easy to teach kids Ayurveda and it really depends on being a good teacher. Uh, I also got my training in the West. I went to Princeton, University yeah. of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Columbia, Harvard, and Rush, University of Chicago for mm -hmm. my trainings. Mm -hmm. And I learned, yes, in lectures, but I also learned very good critical thinking. I learned how to solve problems using cases, but also using puzzles. I learned how to do group-based, which is called team-based learning, uh, group-based learning. and. Um, it's not hard to teach kids these things. The problem, it seems, is that there are a lot of people say, oh, it's hard. Why is it hard? If you're a clinician, you're doing problem solving every day with every patient. So to learn how to take how you're doing it in practice, you know, whether it's in a laboratory or in a clinic setting or in any other um, uh, problem-based setting, which is real life, why not translate that? For kids, using examples, using stories is a great way, using their power of observation and how they observe, and then teaching them, mm -hmm. see the cloud, see the one that's moving really fast, see the one that's below it that's moving slowly. So the one that's moving fast is Gati Gandho. Gati Gandho is movement. Hello, hello, right? hello. Uh, and so um, if you can actually... Uh, let me just remove Elena Gontare because she's being disruptive. Um, okay, sorry about that. Um, if you can actually include these kind of examples based on the child's perception, what the child knows, not just the five senses, but the sixth sense, 
when you can feel something that you just have an instinct about, which is that interoception, as it's called, or it's that intuition. If we can teach that to kids, then they can learn Ayurveda very quickly and it's very logical. What you said about having to learn biology, chemistry, physics, math, and then go into you know the JE, the joint entrance exam and either go to BAMS or MBBS mm -hmm. in India. Uh, what we do um, in this uh, white paper and this international coordination group that we have of Ayurvedic education, we are taking a look. And this week we met and talked about prerequisites and the entire group of ideas. Most of them are ideas. There's a few of us that have um, other trainings as well. We decided that prerequisites should include whatever's required, the uh, biology, chemistry, physics, but also some Sanskrit. They must have at least an ability to read shlokas. They don't need to know all the samasa, sandhi, but they should be able to read shlokas and pick out words. So that's going to be one. Second is they have mm -hmm. to have clinical volunteer work as a mandatory part of the clinical experience by the time they come in. We're thinking of making it a co-requisite that they could do it in the first six months of their training, but they must have it before they move into the other parts. Another um, area that they really have to have is experience in nature. So they need to go either hiking or go learn botany. They have to be gardening, depending on where in the world they are, they have to get experience with the soil, the seed, the sun and understand nature because many people who are sitting grown up in a big metropolitan city whether it's you know frankfurt or delhi they are not learning about the connection of man with nature another part is we want them to do self-care so understanding yoga understanding whatever their own spirituality is and understanding dinacharya ritucharya in daily practice now anyone that's gone to MD or PhD or BAMS or MBBS school knows how terribly the food and the lifestyle is. You're not sleeping properly. There's a lot of stress without stress management. The food is very poor quality in most uh, mess or dormitory or tiffin kind of setups. And if the person that is training to be a healer has their body decaying as they're usually in their 20s or 30s or whatever age they are when they go through the training, what are we teaching the people that are going to be the instruments, right? The, the people that are trying to help heal others. So I hope that feedback was useful for you, Dr. Guha. And uh, I welcome you to write to me at my email and we can continue some discussion. And if you uh, have any specific questions. I Thank see you, Madam. Uh, uh, Ushashi? Madam, last, last question we are going, uh, taking. Uh, that yes. is the last uh, question. Ushashi, your question, please. Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, good, good evening, Varshati ma'am. It's been uh, very lucky to uh, see you. Uh, but uh, actually, I'm right now working in Maharashtra uh, in a college. So, uh, as a Dravidun lecturer. So, I, I described in uh, my uh, in chat section that um, uh, when I, uh, as a Dravidun student, as a scholar, though I have no uh, Ayurved background, First of all, in BMS curriculum, when I pursued uh, BMS uh, around 2008, so I feel difficulty, I feel difficulty to observe the dravyas. So many most common dravyas which are uh, available in our uh, uh, home uh, kitchen, uh, apart from that, so when I pursued MD in Dravyavon and I observed that, uh, new generation needs to know that uh, phytochemicals. Uh, when I take uh, everyday class and when I uh, go for uh, the single health study and I put the phytochemicals thing, so uh, basically like uh, like ascorbic acid. You know? So when I uh, told them what is ascorbic acid and I observed that my students picked up that uh, thing that these herb having containing this ascorbic acid or uh, beta cytosterol uh, or curcumin, it will help them to uh, rem remember and uh, the yes. herbs easy. Dr. Ushashi, can you ask your question because we need to end the session. Uh -huh. So uh, I like this uh, because I like your uh, conversation. So I like to uh, collaborate with you 
for education and uh, uh, teaching more and learning more. That's why I raised my hand. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Do you have a specific question? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. You yeah, I've read, I mean, you just repeated what you wrote in the chat. So I'll just say a couple of words. I have never met a good Dravya Guna teacher in India. I have been to BHU, I've been in Kolkata, I've been in Dehradun, I've been in Kerala, I've been in Udupi, I've been in Bangalore, I've been in uh, so many places. I've yet to meet a good Dravya Guna teacher. Why? Because the syllabus requires you to teach all these phyto constituents to a group of students who are learning ascorbic acid and curcumin and extracts. Extracts are not dravyas. Extracts are, if you want to meet with me and you say, oh, Bhashwati's right hand is very good. You cut off the right hand and you extract just the right hand. And then you work with the right hand because my right hand knows how to do so many things. You're going to separate mm -hmm. it from the rest of me and you cannot call it the entire complete because my right hand is not all of who I am. Not only is the mm -hmm. jivana not there, but it's just a part of it. So it's nice to know the extracts, but these are artifacts of science that we are using right now because people do not have a better way of learning. And what we need to do is take the best models of learning herbalism. So I'm working with the American Herbal Pharmacopoeia. They have some ways of learning, mainly from the Native Americans who are very clear in their tribal ways of learning how to identify herbs, how to use the herbs. And generally what they will do is use the organoleptic. So I took a botanical walk a uh, couple of weeks, last month. And what we were doing is smelling the herb, learning its context from the person who was the guide. And then he was guiding us how to first smell it. If it's too pungent, that's it. That's all you do. Otherwise you take a small part of it and you put it just on your tongue without the rest of your mouth. If it burns, you get it out. If it doesn't burn, then you chew just a little bit of it. You learn how to taste. Most people don't know how to taste. And you take your experience and the experience of the others, and you will never forget that herb. So I actually taste a Japanese barberry, which it turns out is very much like Daru Haridra. And I never correlated them together. But by doing this kind of learning in, I was in New Jersey, I was able to correlate that with Daru Haridra, which I've seen Berberis Aristata. Now, one of the problems, as you've written nicely, is about the terminologies and the words that we use. Dr. Shumit goes all around West Bengal, helps people create herbal gardens, and he knows that teaching laypersons about Dravya Guna is really based on their local area. If you're going to teach someone in West Bengal about herbs like Deodar, which grows up in the high Himalayas, and the person's never been to even Darjeeling, you're not going to be able to teach them. Right? But if there is a context by which you can teach them, you start local and then you show them. Actually, madam, this, this reference already mentioned in Charak, that is uh, due, due to our due to our days, uh, uh, different Anup Desh and Jangam Desh, that is uh, different uh, plants uh, cultivated and different uh, plants automatically grow. Yeah, actually, what I'm saying to... Uh... Oh, Dr. Usha, you have a lot of background noise. Yes, uh, sorry for back. the interruption, but the thing is, after this all method, organoleptic, beside the organoleptic, uh, yeah, in my practical class, I do that organoleptic thing, and so many herb and uh, identification by the curriculum already mentioned in NCISM. The thing is, uh, student never uh, memorize due to lack of the drug subject is too much boring to everyone. Like so you have to make it way. interesting. Listen, I yeah. know that they're boring because I had a teacher at BHU. My teacher in BHU in Dravya Guna was very boring. I've taken Dravya Guna uh, um, intensives, very boring. Because all they do is they go around and say, this is uh, this drug. This is it. There's Haritaki. See that tree? That's Haritaki. See this? This is this. You cannot learn that way. And the problem is that you learned it that way from your teacher. So that's how you're teaching it now that you've become a teacher. Yeah. This is not the way to learn herbs. And what is needed is for a group of people who actually teach about herbs, who are not Dravaguna experts, people like Dr. Shumit, who is looking, he's a scholar of the references. He's reading how Charak recommends to do it. He himself yeah. is out in public. And then he needs to sit with these Dravaguna teachers who think that they have become expert because they've gotten an appointment, but they're not appointed based on competence. They're based on you know, you got your credential and then you become a teacher. 
you need to interact with the students who say, I can't learn this, I can't understand this, this doesn't make sense to me. And there are lots of students who are doing this in the West where they don't even get to go out to a garden and do the organoleptics. So I see Dr. Anais, who's in Brazil, nodding her head. So I spoke with a student in Russia yesterday and she said that they don't have access to the herbs, but they are learning Dravigona and it's so difficult for them because they have no idea why there's 10 herbs in a gunna. They think they have to know all of them and they can't find all of them. And so if they don't have that mustadi gunna kashaya and they can't get it, then they have failed. And what she finally did is she went to India and learned India. that the way to learn it is to read the shlokas and understand that locally you can find certain herbs and not others. Seasonally, you'll find certain herbs and not others. The gunna is to tell you that any of these will work for that particular condition. You have to link it to the effect that it has, the karma and the dosha karma that it has. And if you can do that based on what students already know, not by getting through your syllabus, but by asking them what they know, doing it in a case-based way. So in this case, you could take the same case that I presented and introduce that the patient had taken um, Pushya Nugachuna or she had taken some Shatavri, right? And that forces the students to go and look up what are the herbs that are used for menstrual aberrations or difficulties. And that it forever stay with them because they learned it in that particular case. And if you have 15 cases every semester over two years, then they will have 60 cases that form the basis of everything they learn, 60 paper patients, as we call them. Then they can learn Dravyaguna much more richly. And that's um, what I would like to see us evolve toward. Dr. Ushashi, Dr. Guha, if you are um, interested in working with our international education uh, group and contributing, I welcome you. Um, I think you would learn a lot, but there needs to be humility from all of us. I am a complete failure in you know, mastering Dravyaguna, in mastering many parts of Ayurveda, and yet I have a great working knowledge. So to understand that there's so much to learn when we can teach each other, that is part of the richness of this uh, white paper that we're writing, this report we're writing. And we hope that everyone around the world learning Ayurveda will enjoy it, but also contribute to it. So we can really create a gold standard that is, um, you know, it's a blessing for everyone and all of our students. So um, I uh, want to hand the floor back to Dr. Sumit, but I know that Dr. Pallavi is here and I, she always has good questions. So Dr. Pallavi, can I have permission to give one more question? Now, it, it's, ah. it's not a question, Basapati. It's just to tell you, okay, don't forget, don't leave me behind in your group. Huh? Okay. It's amazing. The, the lecture was amazing and uh, the correlation between how Ayurveda can be incorporated and how to uh, correlate with the modern science and teaching is a challenge and you're doing it so exceptionally well. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. So Dr. Shumit, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, today, at, last, at the last time, we already reached that uh, our Time was 9 p.m. <laughs> I also personally sending Madam that is time is uh, so many times already went. Yes, uh, 37 minutes over time. I'm sorry. Okay. What time? No issue. Uh, no issue, Madam. Actually, uh, today platform was planned for um, for our audience. Uh, may, myself and Madam was planned for only two person. We will uh, discuss. And the rest all will see the, this matter at YouTube. Just uh, today morning, it was decided uh, to shift into Zoom and uh, open to all. Uh, as a result, uh, 9th World Ayurved Congress uh, Facebook page and other social um, handle already madam also shared uh, in uh, her groups um, uh, that is Dinacharya Masterclass and Indica also our fellowship group also. 
and uh, we also share that entire organizers uh, at uh, World Ayurveda Congress. Uh, I expecting uh, here uh, present about um, 45 to now reduced to 32. I expecting all of your presence at upcoming uh, our World Ayurveda Congress uh, from uh, out of India who are presenting uh, here now. I also uh, request you all of you specially because of we have uh, every World Ayurveda Congress we have separate program for international delegate. Uh, Bhaswati Madam can explain details. Uh, also, um, uh, she faced um, many attended many uh, international delegate assembly as a representative from USA. Uh, so, I am requesting all of you uh, from our country and our, um, abroad uh, to uh, please attend. And our um, uh, time is very short because of 31st September, uh, August, it was our uh, time. It is extended up to uh, 15th September only. So kindly, I also just mentioned, uh, you can see the chat box. I also everyone for everyone, I um, shared the uh, official link because for your um, uh, easy to communicate or um, easy to um, reach the abstract submission and registration. So I will request everyone uh, to uh, register uh, within 15 September and those who are interested in presentation for abstract uh, you can say uh, send within 15 September through not um, uh, no need to send mail for abstract it is totally online based and uh, software based because of uh, at the website. Uh, you can see the abstract of um, uh, column that is blink uh, also uh, there. I also separately mentioned that link. Uh, so today, uh, this is the uh, last, uh, not Thank the you least. So we Thank are, you. We are uh, um, closing the uh, program. Thank you all. Thank we'll you. see you again. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Shumit, for inviting me for this program. From my, uh, my India, this time in uh, nine. 40 yes. p.m. We, we did discuss making this a 90 minute session, but we were thinking that not many people would come and we wouldn't have enough material for 90 minutes. But now we realize we should have made it 90 minutes. Thank you very much for inviting thank me. And thank you all. Thank you. You can find this recording on YouTube in uh, whenever it's ready. Thank you. Hello.